So um, as Michael noted during his remarks, <clears throat> Title I was universally embraced, and um, it was used almost immediately once the JOBS Act became effective. And what we have seen is that, indeed, there's been uh, a, a revitalized IPO market. Perhaps not the level of IPO activity um, that certain congressmen and, and you know, other commentators had at first predicted when the JOBS Act was being contemplated, but what we have seen is a return to a, a healthier and more vibrant IPO market. So on this slide, you have some numbers just to give you a sense of who's using the JOBS Act and the extent to which the JOBS Act is getting used. What you'll see is that almost all of the IPOs that have gotten done since the JOBS Act was passed have been um, by companies that qualify as emerging growth companies. And so the stat that you'll see there is about 80%. But since enactment of the JOBS Act, if you were to look at just 2013 IPOs, that percentage would be something closer to 95%. So really almost every company that's doing an IPO is now able to and availing itself of uh, the emerging growth company IPO on-ramp provisions. And it is serving its purpose of permitting tech companies, life science, and biotech companies um, to go public. So if you look at the types of industries where registrants um, have been um, most active in terms of IPOs, tech and life sciences have been um, at the forefront in 2012 and 2013. So maybe we'll skip to some of the specific provisions um, and and who's using what uh, what there, and maybe I'll turn uh, I'll turn to Michael. Thanks, Anna. Um, so, and, and it, maybe what we'll do. Do you want to go back to this sure. for just one second? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Thanks. So one thing, I mean, I had mentioned before that an emerging growth company is one with a total annual revenues of less than a billion. The SEC needs to look at that provision every five years and decide whether or not to adjust that provision upward. And the other thing to keep in mind, which doesn't have much application anymore, but an issuer in order, but there are some situations where this still arises, particularly where somebody's been through some sort of reorganization or restructuring, is in order to qualify as an emerging growth company, the company first has to have sold its common stock in a registered offering on or after December 9th of 2011. So I, I think that there are a number of accommodations that um, emerging growth companies um, that were made for emerging growth companies in the SEC, and this slide lays out um, many of those provisions. You know, we, they can provide two years of audited financials and selected financial data rather than three. They don't need a cDNA. They um, are able to con provide fin uh, registration statements on a confidential basis with the SEC before it needs to, um, you need to get public and sort of expose yourself to the world at large and go through that while in the public forum. I think we can all think of IPOs that have happened in the past where they were publicly filed and going through the SEC comment process and seeing the disclosures that get made and things that the SEC focused on. Now, although the comment letters and the drafts wind up getting public at some point in time, it's all done confidentially and companies are able to take care of all of that before they're sort of subject to scrutiny of the whole world while they're dealing with the SEC. Um, Another accommodation was the ability to test the waters before and after filing a registration statement by engaging in oral or written communications with, with qualified institutional buyers and institutional credit ones. They have an ability to opt out of new financial standards that are adopted. They have the ability to transition to five years for you know for pretty much all of the reporting, but also the auditor attestation requirements. And uh, there also is the ability of a broker-dealer to publish research reports about a company currently registration, even as participating in the offering. You know, the view was that 
the existing rules that um, were in, on place limited this activity, and that was sort of hindering the ability of smaller and newer companies to be able to raise capital. So should we talk about what's... Oh, which of these provisions have been yeah. the most uh, important or most popular with the issuers? So I, I think that if you were to just talk to the issuers <clears throat> and, and leave out the other advisors or the investment banks, I would say they were all very popular with them. Um, but being popular with the issuers and what's been most used are probably two slightly different questions. I think that what you're seeing as far as the, the, the most used provision by far is the ability to confidentially file registration statements and, and get ready to go public outside of the eye and the scrutiny of the markets, reporters, um, everyone else. Um, what this has done, and, and Anna mentioned in her remarks that you know the, uh, there, the, we are seeing an uptick in IPOs, but maybe not as much as what people wanted. But because these are all filed, submitted confidentially, nobody has really a, a good idea as to what's in the pipeline. Which, um, if you talk to investment bankers, they don't like because it provides uncertainty because they can now have diff more difficulty advising their clients as to um, what's in the pipeline, sort of working on timing, when's a good time to go, when's a bad time to go, um, what are your, who, what's out there from a competitor standpoint, you know, we need to get in here quick, we need to get in here late, whatever. I mean, they don't have that, that sort of market check that they, like they used to be able to have, but this is by far the most, most used provision. Um, probably another one of the most used provisions is the ability to reduce the compensation disclosure to not provide CDNA. Um, I find this one sort of interesting. I think people don't think that um, full-blown compensation disclosure, a CDNA, is now all that necessary to be able to sell um, their securities and the IPO, which sort of goes against everything the SEC has been doing and trying to build up the compensation disclosures in CDNA. But this, again, is another provision, and I think in most situations, if you talk to the advisors, the investment banks, they all say it doesn't really matter. I think one of those reasons is, uh, is I might be being a little bit glib, but the practices from before, the compensation practices from before you were public versus after what they are at the time you go public and, 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 and later, they may change. And so therefore, kind of a detailed discussion of what decisions were made and why from before you're going public just really isn't all that relevant. Um, um, I think, you know, I think, uh, I, 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 those are probably the two most popular provisions. I, um, I would agree with that. Um, we now spend an, an awful lot of time talking with issuers as well as with investment banks about some of the other provisions, specifically um, relying on the EGC accommodations and providing reduced financial information. So as we were talking about, uh, an emerging growth company can elect to present two years. However, what we're seeing there is that at first, investment banks specifically were very reluctant to encourage companies to rely on the accommodation and were encouraging companies to provide financial information for a longer period of time. And the argument that we heard most frequently um, raised by bankers is that institutional investors really wanted to see a company's track record over a longer period of time and uh, would have been asking for that longer uh, financial presentation in meetings. So if you're asking for it in meetings or if um, people expect that it's going to be presented in the context of a roadshow, then you really need to include it in the um, IPO registration statement. Now, that may be softening a little bit as market practice evolves and as uh, we all get a little bit more comfortable with the JOBS Act. If you look and test at different periods of time, what you see is that in more recent IPOs, um, there has been a little bit of an indication, and I say a little bit because it really also is very dependent on the type of company. There's been a little softening in that, and we are seeing a few companies that are coming um, with only the two years. And that tends to be companies where perhaps financial results may not be all that significant. And what I mean by that is in the context, for example, of a biotech company, 
um, where they principally have losses. Having that longer financial uh, period may not be you know, quite as revealing or quite as telling. Um, as opposed to a company that does have revenues, a consumer products company, let's say, where it's important to see those trends over a longer period of time. Um, the other aspect where we're seeing a little bit of uh, variability is on uh, EGCs tending to um, defer their, uh, their adoption of um, financial uh, of generally accepted, uh, newly promulgated, generally accepted accounting principles. Um, there again, you sort of see some variance in practice. Some companies are choosing to delay that, um, but but not uh, enough where we can sort of make a statement across the board about um, acceptance on that. So really, confidential filings. Um, and executive comp or, or where we really see a big difference, I would say. And on that last point on the um, ability to defer compliance with new financial standards, I mean, I think initially when this provision came out, everybody was leaning towards saying they were going to opt in and comply with everything. And now as this has been going on for a little over a year, I think you're seeing more discussion and sort of thoughtful consideration in deciding what they're going to do as opposed to sort of automatically opting in. I think that's right. Um, the other area where we're seeing some um, developing practice is test the waters. So as Michael was saying, an emerging growth company can go out and um, before its IPO, before its submitted confidentially its registration statement before or even while it's undergoing this confidential submission process, it can go out and uh, approach qualified institutional buyers or institutional accredited investors and talk to them about the offering, the company, its business plan, and so on. Um, almost instinctively, issuers thought that this was a, a great new um, opportunity for them, and they were going to have a lot more flexibility. Um, we work with a lot of foreign private issuers, and they have always been able to do this in Europe and in Asia. And so being able to do this in the United States was a very welcome change. They thought it was really archaic that the SEC had all these artificial prohibitions on gun jumping and communications before an IPO. In practice, what we're seeing is that Bankers most often are telling companies that institutional investors don't want to be bothered or contacted too early in the process. They want to be contacted when things have really come together, when um, the issuer has been through a few rounds with the SEC and the disclosure has more or less settled, when um, the issuer is closer to officially launching its roadshow. So it hasn't worked out in quite the way that Congress necessarily intended because this test the waters provision was supposed to save issuers money. Um, it was supposed to essentially permit an issuer to go and see if there was a market, uh, an appetite for um, its securities before it spent all of the time and effort and uh, money associated with a full-blown IPO process. What we are seeing is that in a couple of sectors, again, like biotech, where um, it's very specialized and where there's a need, for example, to engage with professional institutional investors familiar in that sector with um, the company's patent portfolio, its technologies, and that requires an investment of time on the investor's part. Um, these test the waters conversations are happening. So maybe that's a, a glimmer of hope that over time, um, it'll be a more accepted practice. Yeah, I think, what I, and just sort of hitting on that last point, I think what you're seeing also are just sort of some conversations, not even, as Anna pointed out, investors, as for the most part, were saying, we don't really have the time, you know, you need to be further along in your process, you know, have a document or whatever. But I think you are seeing some investors willing to sort of talk about a very initial phase about, whether somebody's got an idea, is that something that might be worth uh, exploring and going public? Unfortunately, that's at the phase, at the stage where it may not be an offer in the first place and may not need this provision to take advantage of. Um, and so it doesn't really save the companies much money in trying to decide whether or not to start going down the road before they can really get some good feedback from the investor. 
So before switching gears and uh, talking about private offerings and accredited crowdfunding, one last uh, note. So um, as Michael said, another benefit or accommodation for emerging growth companies is that the SE, the co Congress um, relaxed a lot of the prohibitions on uh, research coverage, a lot of the quiet periods around uh, around research in proximity to an offering. So in theory, under the JOBS Act, uh, an investment bank, even one that's participating in the IPO, could provide pre-deal research, research on the company before the IPO is completed. And it also could immediately, once the offerings uh, been consummated, can come out with research. And the uh, JOBS Act requires that no SRO, so namely FINRA, um, or the SEC impose any uh, arbitrary prohibition on research. So FINRA uh, amended its rules to coordinate and harmonize with the JOBS Act. And uh, here, unfortunately, we still have the legacy of the IPO research settlement, which prevents a handful of the largest investment banks from really taking advantage of these rules. And what that's done is that it has sort of forced the market to um, migrate to what these firms can do. And so now uh, what has happened is that there's this informal 25-day instead of 40 days. So granted, we've made some improvement. 25-day um, lag between completion of an IPO and when an investment bank actually commences and publishes research on the emerging growth company. We really haven't seen any take-up of pre-deal research. So investment banks having been um, uh, traumatized by research settlements, by the prospect of litigation and regulatory actions, have been really very reluctant to write research on a company before it's going public. So not clear that that'll change anytime soon unless perhaps um, we have different uh, different rules relating to liability or clarity relating to liabil liability for research. I, I think it's really interesting that Congress decided to prohibit the SEC or FINRA from adopting or maintaining rules that prohibit this, but didn't also address the IPO um, a settlement, uh, research settlement thing, which is really what's one of the big, obviously the, the other rules were there and prohibiting, but this, the IPO settlement was a well-known thing that was going on that was going to limit these companies from participating anyway. I agree. So I think that you know we'll we'll continue to see companies test the boundaries of different Jobs Act provisions of Title One. Um, we might see some smaller, more specialized broker dealers publish research earlier before that 25-day period, or even come out with pre-deal research, but. Um, I would say that in the context of IPOs, the Jobs Act is probably, you know, a starting point, and we uh, we would uh, need to look for additional changes to um, really restore uh, a an IPO market for smaller companies. Uh, before turning to a Title II of the Jobs Act, um, at Lexis Practice Advisor, we're very focused on providing practical guidance to lawyers. So. I wanted to get your perspective on how Title I has impacted the, the lawyer's work and role in the IPO process. Um, sure, why don't <laughs> I'll start, Ron. Um, you know, you know, it, it, it uh, you could sit here and look at it on one level. It may not have had, it, it may not really provide a lot of impact at all. Um, uh, because you still are preparing the disclosure document, you're still looking at competitors' disclosures, you're still providing advice on the things that you used to provide. I think what where it is doing now are, as Anna was pointing out and as, the, as was highlighted on the slides, there's now a greater discussion about um, all of the things that the Jobs Act provides in whether it's a good thing or a bad thing and involving various of the advisors in that decision-making process. So there is time spent just looking at these Jobs Act provisions because issuers, I think, generally across the board would want to try to take advantage of every one of them. And it requires a discussion to try to, to, to go through. And as Anna had 
on, on, on some of the slides, you know, highlighting percentages of people taking advantage of provisions or taking advantage of things generally. One of the interesting things in the Jobs Act was that it prohibited the SEC from disclosing anything that had been confidentially submitted. So nobody actually, unless you're working on the filing or you hear about the filing, that's something that's been submitted confidentially, you don't actually know what's there or what the practices are that are there or how the SEC's process is evolving um, with regard to ongoing processing of registration statements. So we only can look at things once they're actually filed, which is 21 days before they want to begin a roadshow. And, and, and so one of the ways practice is changing is very constantly monitoring what winds up showing up getting That's what winds up showing getting publicly filed so that we can take a look at that and decide how that might impact the draft um, of a document that we're currently working on because it will reflect sort of the current SEC thinking on you know what you might have to be disclosing on the cover or what where market practice might be going generally with regard to what investment banks are advising and things like that that might be advisors other than your own uh, working with your own clients. Yeah, I think we tend to have more discussions um, to, to uh, the same uh, on the same topic about when to flip from confidential filing to public. Um, a lot of those discussions are very strategic. For example, if the company is also contemplating doing uh, an M and A transaction a dual track, maybe an IPO, maybe a sale, um, or if the company is going to disclose, again, for business reasons, whether by tweet or otherwise, that it's actually confidentially filed with the SEC. Um, so we talk about that a great deal. We also talk about the timing of uh, commencing the roadshow. Um, again, some investment banks um, only feel comfortable engaging in test the waters communications or these preliminary meetings when um, the registration statement has gone, has been publicly filed for the first time. So we spend an awful lot of time talking about those, that all of those various sort of tactics and strategies. As uh, we were all talking about, what the SEC final rule does is create this bifurcated universe. So you can still do a private placement under Rule 506B where you're not using general solicitation. And with that 506B offering, you also can rely on the traditional statutory private placement exemption, Section 4A2. So the SEC's rule and the JOBS Act doesn't change the statutory private placement regime. 4A2, if you're doing an offering, traditional private placement, just relying on the statutory exemption, you can't generally solicit. If you do a 506B offering, you're not going to be using general solicitation. So the new rule, 506C, permits general solicitation provided that certain conditions are met. Um, that the issuer is going to take reasonable steps to verify that the purchasers are accredited, uh, that the purchasers are indeed accredited either because they fit within one of the categories or the issuer reasonably believes at the time uh, the securities are sold that they're accredited and that all the conditions of, uh, for, for use of right D are satisfied. So a lot of um, ambiguity remains for, as Mike was saying, the inadvertent communication. If you didn't intend for your offering to be a 506C, which suggests that you have to take these additional verification steps, you really were planning on doing a 506B, but the CEO or someone else made an inadvertent statement. Does that bump you into this new world of 506C? And then, if you're in 506C land, um, what are reasonable steps to verify that your investors are accredited? So the SEC has these sort of um, principles-based um, provisions. You have to you know, apply common sense and think that what's reasonable is going to vary uh, depending on the circumstances. So you have to think about the purchaser. If a purchaser is an institution, well, then it stands to reason that your additional steps to verify needn't be as intrusive as if the purchaser is uh, an individual. 
Um, likewise, if you already have information about the purchaser. So if you're a company that's using a broker-dealer, the broker-dealer is going to its existing customer base, and those are known customers of the broker-dealer, well, then perhaps no additional steps need be taken because there is that pre-existing substantive relationship. The broker-dealer knows their customer, has loads of information about that customer, and it also depends on the nature of the offering. So if it's an offering that's conducted with a broker-dealer, um, probably fewer steps, whereas if it's an offering of the type that Anne-Marie was talking about, using one of these internet-based platforms, you're um, reaching far and wide uh, to attract investors who you have no prior relationship with. Additional steps uh, there would be more intrusive. So the final rule does um, address a lot of the concerns that commenters had in terms of providing a roadmap for, for the steps that um, would constitute um, reasonable efforts in terms of verifying accreditation.